yeah, you know. Okay, so welcome to the November Sydney Lectures uh, with our guests from Our House University, Wendy and Finn, who are going to introduce themselves to you and uh, tell you about their um, who they are and what they're going to be doing. So if you want to go ahead and get started, we'll, um, I'll shut up and you can take over. Yeah, thank you. Finn? Yes. I, you, I guess you all know who's who, but just to be sure, this is Winnie uh, and this is uh, Finn. My name is Finn. I'm a professor of corporate communication at Aarhus University, or what used to be called the, the, the business school. Um, thank you to Michael for inviting us. Uh, I've been uh, talking to colleagues uh, several times during the last week, just to mention that we were offering something called the Sydney Lectures. I'm so uh, proud, although we are staying inside Winnie's office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I study uh, and I teach uh, several things, but it's mainly about crisis and issues and risks. Yeah. And as Finn already said, my name is Winnie. Finn and I have actually been working together for more than 25 years uh, here at the business school at Aarhus University in Denmark. So uh, like Finn, I'm a full professor and I'm working with crisis management and crisis communication, <clears throat> but I'm a professor within corporate communication. So I've been working with public relations and branding and change management, employee communication during the years. So we, we have we have a lot of topics, but but we we seem to get back to crisis and crisis management again and again, uh, and <clears throat> that's also why we are going to talk about crisis management as the new normal. Uh, but we'll say more about this in in a, in a few seconds. But it's true, as Finn said, we are in my office, and it's not fake. These are my books, and well you know, impression management, this is what we call it. Uh, but uh, as we just talked to Michael about what's going to happen with all these books, people are not interested in books anymore <laughs> in the same way. My students prefer eBooks, so they don't even want my books if I want to offer them some. So that's a crazy world, but um, let's get started. And uh, we did decide to put up a couple of slides um, for you <clears throat> because uh, then it's perhaps easier to follow what's going on. But this is the agenda, a little bit about the new normal, then a little bit about the history, very briefly, but in order to situate the rhetorical arena theory. And then we want to give you some examples of patterns and interdependencies of the voices of the participants in an arena when a crisis breaks out. Uh, actually, we could say that we know that um, the arena, the rhetorical arena is not just used for crisis. We have used it for studies on internal social media uh, and employee reactions and stuff like that. So it is actually a, a theory that is useful also for other kind of voices interactions. But anyway, uh, and finally, we will end up by talking about the contributions, what we see as the contributions of rhetorical arena theory, or RAD, as we call it, uh, to the new normal of crisis management. But um, I think for questions, well, maybe at the end, uh, but, but that's what you normally do, I think, when I saw the other. So I will start and then Finn, you will come in later on. This is how we normally do it. Hmm? Sure, and so, you can do anything that works for you, you know, like if you want to do questions, yeah. go along, just ask, but if you yeah, want yeah. to save them, whatever, whatever works best for you. Yeah, okay, that's fine. <clears throat> but um, to start with, can I help with this? Okay, so to start with, <clears throat> are we living in a, in a new world where crisis management has become the new normal? And we actually think so, um, because if you take a look at what's going on in the world today, we have a lot of discussions about Me Too, anti-racism, abortion debate, uh, DEI, cyber attacks, data misuse, pandemics, as we all know, lockdowns, layoffs, bankruptcies for companies. Climate changes and sustainability has means changes of consumer habits, flight shame, meat shame, slow consumption, for instance, slow fashion and so forth. 
and it has made a lot of changes to market conditions. So many, many companies are constantly working with the crisis issues. The war in Ukraine has uh, had a huge impact on what's going on, at least in Europe. Uh, economic crisis, inflation, energy issues, and of course, the usual scandals. So all in all, uh, it seems as if companies are going from one issue, one crisis type to another. And we actually think that some of the tools and instruments from within crisis management are useful in the daily life of organizations. Second, and this is um, an idea we have had for a long time, we think we're living in an age of interferences as well. Uh, you know, when we got the internet, we got the corporate technology, as Moore and Seymour named it, you know, social media, chuk, suddenly it hits you. Suddenly there's a critique and it's growing out there. But we're also living in the risk society of Ulrich Beck, the network society, the post-factual society, and what we name society of interferences. And all these elements are making people think differently about what's going on. So we are experiencing a new communicative power balance and an increased risk of issues, criticism and crisis, meaning we have a very high speed of changes inside organizations today because they have to adapt constantly. But the communication processes have changed to become phenomena where a lot of actors <clears throat> interfere and posit their own agendas and where we have more and more interventions from what we call third parties. You know, the first party could be the organization in a crisis, second party, well, the affected victims. Um, but we have third parties, meaning people interfering just to interfere because they have their own agendas. It can be politicians, NGOs, citizens, but it could also be unauthorized actors just like hackers, trolls, critiques, et cetera. So it's really, it has really turned difficult um, to companies. And that is why we think that they can learn to work and navigate in these kind of rhetorical arenas. And we will get back to this, but some of the keywords are multivocality. A lot of voices start communicating when there is an issue, when there is a crisis. Um, and they communicate to one another with, from, but also against past and even just about one another. So not all voices want dialogue. Some of them definitely don't want dialogue at all. So what do we do with these kinds of things? That creates polarization and antagonism. So it is quite complicated out there, but we will get back to this. So how can you navigate? Well, what we see right now is that we have um, uh, CEOs and organizations that take on new roles, corporate citizens as brand activists, but also as corporate politicians. They even deal with foreign policy, taking a political stance. We saw it, for instance, with the war in Ukraine, that companies go out and go against Russia, taking a political stance. Uh, and the CEO very often becomes a chief engagement officer in social media. I have never seen so many CEOs going out in, on social media to express political stances like we see it today. But it can be risky. And that's where we come in as communication scholars and communication counselors. Uh, and some of the elements we can use from crisis management, I think, the key words are signal detection, to avoid crisis, strategic listening. You know, this is really an upcoming issue. And you have, of course, Jim McNamara and his wonderful book on organizational listening or the power of strategic listening by Lori Lewis uh, from the US. It's about anticipation, but it's also about <clears throat> resilience. How can you as a community, as a company, uh, as a country become more resilient? It's about contingency. You need to be able to improvise and, you know, find, do diagnosis and stuff like that. And finally, it's also about digital communication management. So a lot of things have changed, but we also think that this is the moment for us, actually, to step forward. Uh, Finn and I have been discussing a lot. Can we actually talk about the golden age of communication? Communicators' time to shine. <laughs> I'm not fully sure, but 
we have been discussing it during COVID because so many communicators were highly valued during COVID. Um, for instance, we have a couple of surveys from the Nordic countries um, where it is said the communication department has been brought closer to top management due to a situation where communication turned critical for company business. The eyes rest on the communication department during uncertainty and crisis. We have learned how much we can achieve with communication. These were some of the quotes from the participants. And we did a small study on with the data from the European communication report on the Nordic countries. And they also confirmed that they have stepped up. They have become more highly valued. They're really part of what is going on. So we actually see it as a golden age or a good time for communicators, but also for communication scholars. We have so many new issues and, and research where we can contribute to what's going on in society. That was a short start on the new normal. Now Finn mm -hmm. will take over. <laughs> Are you here, Finn? Yeah. <laughs> and, and tell you a little bit about uh, why we started working with rhetorical arena theory. Yes. Um, hello again. Um, I, I think you all know uh, the importance of uh, being of knowing a little about where you are situated uh, historically mm -hmm. speaking. Um, what what to what is your tradition? Uh, it's it's important because you can uh, you can be much more explicit when uh, to when explaining and describing um, your, uh, your topics. So uh, what I would like to do here is to uh, tell you the story very shortly of uh, crisis communication, of the different types of crisis communication. And if you disagree, we would like to, to, to know, not necessarily now or here, but uh, send us a note if you think this is horrible. Um, if you take this slide, you will see that we have um, a distinction between three different um, approaches to crisis communication. This is not all of it. There are more uh, approaches than, uh, than is listed here, uh, and some of them go, goes back uh, to the early um, 1980s. So some of them are pretty old, but this is, um, this is what, what we find the most interesting. The first tradition is the rhetorical or text-oriented approach. Uh, it's um, based mainly on Bill Benoit's image repair theory, um, presented for the first time in his book uh, from 1995. Uh, we have squeezed in another rhetorician by the name of Keith Michael Herrit. Um, we call his theory terminological control theory, but this is um, this is a little crazy because he has never accepted this name, but it corresponds very well to what he is doing. Then we have the second tradition, um, the, the, the the strategic or context oriented approach. Um, this is more or less uh, what many people see as crisis communication as such, because it's they, this tradition, this approach is uh, represented by uh, Coombs. And there are more uh, people in this uh, tradition in contingency theory of accommodation, that is Cameron and Gus Pang, if you know any of them. Um, but um, the, the main, the main uh, idea behind this theory is that you, if you want to, to, um, to, to give an answer to the question, when is, um, when is it best to, to use which uh, crisis response strategy, you need some contextual factors, and I will return to this very shortly, but it's, um, it's, it's a quite uh, fascinating theory. And then blah, 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 we have the two uh, people from Denmark with their multivocal approach. Uh, and we will uh, try to give you a more detailed insights in, about this theory. 
Okay, let me see. Yeah, here we have the rhetorical or text oriented approach. We will not go into details with all of this, but um, the, the, the main idea uh, is that we want, when we are studying this aspect, this approach, we want to know more about what people are saying and how they are saying it uh, in a crisis situation. Is the, is the textual oriented approach. Um, it uh, appeared in the 19, uh, as early as the 1960s and 1970s and 80s, uh, but um, if we use Bill Benoit as our uh, guide, uh, we better start with uh, the mid 1990s. Um, I think I will just say a little about terminological control theory. Please be aware this is an invention that, that we have uh, made. It, it, here it uh, has never accepted this, this name. But what's interesting about, uh, what's interesting about uh, the, the, the terminological control theory is that it's very clearly uh, based on uh, social constructionism as, um, as uh, the, the philosophy of science uh, that is relevant for, for, for this approach. I don't know if you are working with um, uh, social constructionism. We find it very, very stimulating to, to work with this approach. Uh, it's, it's impossible, in fact, according to us, to, to um, to, to do some proper uh, uh, scientific work without uh, having such a social constructionism approach. Um, and here it was, in fact, the first who, uh, here it was the first to, 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 to define uh, what he, he understood by uh, social constructionism. And what's very interesting is that he's using Burke, Kenneth Burke, who has written some very fascinating essays about this. Okay, um, what's happening? <coughs> we're, we're using my computer, so I will, here you are. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, here we have uh, the other, um, the second uh, approach, the strategic or context-oriented approach. The first one with Benoit was uh, uh, based on uh, what do they say and how do they say it in a crisis situation. Here it's more like um, uh, when is they talking and, and where is they talking and to whom is they talking in a crisis situation. It's, it's more uh, oriented towards uh, people uh, who are actors uh, being part of a, a crisis situation. Um, I think you, you, know, you know all this, and I'm sure that, I didn't check it, but I'm sure that uh, Tim was here. And uh, um, so, so I'm not going to, to, to say a lot, but um, it's, it's, um, it's the word strategic is, is very important here. And, um, um, but, but there are also some problems uh, uh, linked to this approach um, that we will return to later on and which form the basis of our um, uh, rhetorical, uh, uh, our rat approach. Yes. Yeah, I will see if it works. It works. Um, just one more slide, and uh, we have the full overview. Um, um, it's um, it's our approach, uh, the multivocal approach, and um, it's funny. But if you if you take a look at uh, what Murphy or uh, <coughs> or or here it are writing here now and then 
you see that they are so close at inventing the rhetorical arena of theory themselves. Um, uh, because what is um, the basic idea is that if you take a look at uh, a crisis, it could be a very small crisis, uh, like a, a product recall crisis, or it could be something very big. But if you take a look at this, one characteristic is that there are many voices out there. This is uh, the, 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 the idea. Uh, uh, behind this approach uh, that uh, there are many, many voices. Um, this means, or this um, forces you to incorporate some kind of um, complexity theory. It's difficult to uh, not to include uh, complexity theory if you're working um, with such a perspective on, on crisis uh, communication, uh, you, you need to have something which is multivocal uh, in, your, in your study. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, just, uh, yeah, Let, let's, let's take a look at rads. But just one more comment before we uh, continue. Um, we we are we have produced we have established this theory, uh, the rhetorical arena theory, and what we are witnessing today is that young students, PhD students or colleagues, they are now trying to take over, uh, and um, we will return to this later on. Okay, um, what is RAT? Uh, RAT is a theory that applies, uh, 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 that applies a multivocal approach to crisis communication in order to identify and explain communicative complexity of crisis situations. And by crisis situations, we, we, we refer to every every type of crisis uh, uh, situation. It's not, it's not uh, something which is reserved for, for just a, spe a specialist group of, of uh, approaches, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, RAT refers to the social space that opens up when a crisis occurs, in which multiple voices communicate uh, to, with, against, past, and about each other. This is not necessarily the strongest part of the theory, but we can discuss that later on. Um, this open space, uh, open social space, is not uh, open all the time, uh, but it can be. It can be. It can be open. Uh, a uh, long time before, or it can be open a long time after, but um, there are a lot of uh, uh, possibilities there. Then we have the, the, the two key or the two root metaphors, arena and voice. Uh, and um, we're going to, to dig deeper into this later in this lecture, but um, let me just say a few things about uh, arena and voice. Uh, arena is an agonistic model. Um, or to, to, to put it in, in a different way, uh, we're not sure if, um, if um, Grunig would like this uh, uh, approach uh, uh, because uh, and, and I, I'm also very interested in knowing if 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 Michael likes this or if you like this, this is uh, this is quite uh, interesting. Um, the two metaphors are arena and voice, um, and um, let me see. Yeah, um, but uh, I, I think we will we will uh, continue with that later on. There, there's something that um, rat is not. Something that rat is not. Um, and the first thing that rat is not is it's not a public sphere theory. 
um, they um, the, these multiple voices that we study uh, when they communicate in a crisis situation is not only located in a, a, a public sphere, it's also uh, located in a semi-public or in private spheres. So there's no Habermas in this. Um, he has left the building in this version. Um, a second theory uh, that uh, hasn't anything to do with uh, the total arena theory is uh, Freeman's um, uh, theory of stakeholders. stakeholders. Um, um, this is not the case. Uh, I know that we sometimes are suffering from slips of the tongue and we use ourselves, the, the, the stakeholder concepts, but um, mainly it's, it's not a, a theory of, of stakeholders or whatever it is. It, it is, um, yeah, um, this is very important, but we will return to this uh, later on. And now comes, um, now comes the, the model yeah. that we, we are fighting with um, again and again. Yeah, so it's my turn to tell you a little bit and I will turn this, it's, it's very theoretical right now. I, I will try to explain it by using the models and giving you some, some examples that may show what is meant here. Because when Finn says it's not a stakeholder theory, it means we are not looking at the organization um, and its stakeholders. We are looking at who are the voices stepping in when there is a crisis or an issue coming up. You know, when we do stakeholder management, we normally have the organization in the center, and then all the stakeholders around. Uh, but in the rhetorical arena, you have more people in there. You also have people who are not stakeholders to a company, but who are in there for their own agenda or for other reasons. So what we want to capture is who are the voices stepping in when there is a situation. Uh, and that's why we have it's a very simple model. <laughs> at least we are not so good at drawing. But this should illustrate that you have different voices out there. Some of them are communicating to support one another. Some of them are communicating against one another. And some of them are just communicating for the sake of communicating. So it's a mess out there. And if you are a company and you are to think about a crisis situation as an arena, you need to be aware of the other voices out there and you need to be aware of what will they do. So if we go out as a company denying we have a problem or excusing, giving an apology, what would be the reactions of the other voices in there? And what would they then do next? So it's like to play chess. You know, when you play chess, you need to anticipate uh, what the other will do if you do this and that. And some companies and people for that matter in a crisis situation tend to forget that there is all these different voices reacting in different ways out there. So that is actually what the, the, that was why we choose the term voice and arena to illustrate um, this, um, I wouldn't call it a game, but still uh, you need to be able to navigate in this arena in order to come out of it in a good way. So the rhetorical arena is actually working with a two-layered model. So the macro component, here we try to study the patterns of interactions between all these voices that you can see here, but we're also studying each of the communication processes in that arena. So here we move to the micro level. And at the micro level, it looks like this. We are actually saying that every time there's a voice in there communicating to somebody else, uh, you have a traditional sender receiver situation. You have crisis communication and it may be crisis response strategies, but there's much more to it. We need to take the context into account. We need to take the media, the kind of media has an impact on the way we formulate our communication, the genre that we are using, whether it's a press release or it's a television interview or a comment on social media. And finally, the text itself. And the text itself 
it can be words, but also visuals, artifacts, actions, behavior, uh, body language. Everything is actually communicating. So there's more to it, we claim, than the 14 crisis response strategies that we are familiar with uh, from the theory of uh, William Benoit. We have also been working with um, the arena. It's a large arena, as you may imagine. Uh, but within the arena, <clears throat> we do find sub arenas or at least social spaces where some people step in and start communicating. Um, and this concept was launched a decade ago, and it was Timothy Coombs and Sherry Holiday who started working with this. And then we started collaborating. We did a study together on the Lance Armstrong doping crisis in order to see what happened in the different social media channels. Who were the voices stepping in where? Well, was it the same voices? Were they crossing over? What were they actually doing? So we actually think that the idea of studying sub-arenas will also help us in understanding the complexity of what is going on. So uh, as, as it is defined here, a larger rhetorical arena is composed of a number of sub-arenas that consist of spaces where crisis publics or voices may express and hear about the crisis. And these voices, they contribute to the communication, but they are also influenced by the interpretation of others. Um, but here we have a lot of unsolved questions still. How big or small can a sub-arena be? Is two people enough to form a sub-arena when we have a situation? What is not a sub-arena? Is it just a matter of communication channels? No. So this is actually the kind of questions that we're discussing right now. We try to put it up to simplify it like this. So if you have the large arena, you may have sub-arenas where people are you know, crossing over or interrelated, uh, for instance, on social media. But let us illustrate this because it has been quite technical perhaps until now. Um, so um, we want to illustrate some of these patterns that we have found because what we're interested in is the communicative complexity. So how can we deal with that as an organization in a crisis situation? So we need to find out what kind of patterns are there and how can we take these patterns into account? Uh, a simple pattern would be you have an attack criticism followed by a verbal defense. Uh, that was actually what started Bill Benoit. But you also have a lot of complex patterns out there. For instance, you have hate holders versus fate holders. You have multi-crisis. You have third party interventions like politicians, activists and trolls. You have blame games and crisis exploitation. For instance, politicians attacking the government for not dealing correctly with the situation. So vote for me next time. Huh? That's the idea behind it. You have crisis communication of meta organizations, for instance, like trade associations. And you had a lot of interdependencies among voices from the public sector, the political sector, and the corporate sector. And I think this was illustrated during COVID. The voices in COVID, you both had health authorities, you had politicians, but it also had an impact on the companies, did it not? And of course, you all still have the, the citizens as well. So there are many patterns, and I think it could be fruitful for us to study some of it and actually to make the field move forward. But let me illustrate just a simple or one of the first ones that we did study ourselves. This was customers or citizens. What is happening if a private or public organization has a situation? And here we have an illustration when a customer gets angry. It's a study from 2012 where, and I think customer complaints or citizen complaints are quite usual stuff. But this dissatisfied customer posts a farewell note on the Facebook site of the telecommunication company, Telenor Denmark. He was angry because he has experienced a lot of unpleasant things, incorrect handling of bills, overcharging, messy bookkeeping, et cetera, et cetera. So he puts up a note saying, goodbye to Lenoir. That's all for me from this time. And it created <clears throat> the very first shitstorm or firestorm for the Tilenor company. Uh, and <clears throat> we did an interview with Tilenor, and they found this is completely hopeless. So many people are coming in. What, what are we going to do? 
And remember, this is 10 years ago. <clears throat> it was back in 2012. And um, a couple of students of ours did a study on the arena. And they studied the Facebook sub arena. And here are the voices that they identified. The guy who triggered it all, Telenor, of course, Telenor customers coming in, previous Telenor customers coming in saying, we have had the same kind of problems. And a lot of customers from rival phone companies coming in saying, we have had the same kind of problems too. Don't go to our company. Or they said, come to my company. It's much better. Okay. So these were the patterns here. Uh, but what was very interesting was, let me see if I can make it move. Huh? It moved too quickly, I would say. Um, what was very interesting was that you had faith holders coming in. So you had a lot of very critical customers and they started communicating to one another and to Telenor. But then the faith holders started stepping in, the people who supported Telenor. Um, and if you look at this, you can see here, you have actually the crisis response strategies that are well known from either Coombs or Benoit, defensive ones attacking the accuser, denial, good intentions, differentiation, et cetera. And at the bottom, you have the more accommodative strategies, bolstering, corrective action, apology, et cetera. Now, Telenor went out apologizing, offering compensation, doing corrective action. The faith holders, they went out attacking the accuser, criticizing the hate holders. So suddenly you had a huge war going on in there. That was so interesting. And here we counted the voices and 18% 80, of the almost 5,000 comments out there were supporters, faith holders. That's a good thing for a company, I suppose. But take a look at what they said. They attacked the hate holders, the critical customers, for instance, by um, attacks related to responsibility. Remember, you are yourself responsible for payment. It isn't Telenor's fault that people don't pay timely or related to their behavior. Your awful complainers crying and whining in front of your screens. Wake up and talk to the company. Or attacks related to code of conduct. Shame on you. All your filth doesn't belong on Facebook, etc. So they were forcing the negative voices to go out and defend themselves. So we have a whole arena situation in that Facebook uh, thing. If you want to see more for the coding met methodology, you can go to the, to the article. But this was on the Telenor Facebook page. If we want to look into some of the other sub arenas, we know from the interview we did with Telenor that <clears throat> inside Telenor, they completely disagree on what to do. They did not know what to do. This was the very first time they have ever had a crisis like this. As they said, it's our first public relations crisis and it's awful. They did not know what to do and they made a lot of mistakes. But internally, <clears throat> as you can see, you have, of course, a whole group of people again who are discussing uh, the crisis. There was, it went on television. There was a television program uh, commenting on it. And on its online website, you had a lot of voices going in again, commenting on what they saw and so forth. So we could even put in more sub arenas. So that's perhaps the problem with rhetorical arena you will never be able to do an exhaustive, a total analysis of everything that is going on. But we can concentrate on some of the most important uh, sub arenas in this case. I hope this gives you an idea about how uh, the arena works. Um, <clears throat> let me see, I'm not sure about time. Oh, I hope you will manage <clears throat> a little more. Because uh, let me take some water. Yeah. But I hope that it illustrates actually what we think about when we talk about arena. Just another <clears throat> tiny little example. And this is a more recent one, or at least it's from 2018, where some of you may remember that HM was accused of racism because they published on their website a new catalog. And there was this photo of this little boy carrying a hoodie with the inscription coolest monkey in the jungle. And immediately one of the influencers, The Weeknd, who's actually had a contract with H&M for doing music, 
He went out, woke up this morning, shocked and embarrassed by this. I'm deeply offended and will not be working with H&M anymore. And H&M immediately went out trying to give an apology, but it did not work. They gave a new apology. It did not work. And finally, they ended up saying, we are listening to you. We have now installed a corporate social responsible officer taking care of this and this and that. So actually, H&M, it was a mistake, they said, and they were listening. But our students, they tried to put up again a, an overview with a focus on influencers. So here you can see another way of trying to identify the voices in the arena. It, it's in Danish, but I think you can still understand it. You have the H&M. You have The weekend, LeBron James, Stephanie Yebois, three different influencers who were talking a lot about this in their own field on social media. Liam and Terry Mango, that was the little boy and his mother. They loved this. Uh, they were so sad about that story. It went to the print media. You can see them in the periphery. And then, of course, you had a lot of citizens and so forth. So people are trying to identify uh, some of the patterns going on inside these arenas. So this was just a short example. Oh, what is going on here? I'm going too fast. Uh, should I continue, Finn? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, we wanted to show you a couple of examples of patterns. Uh, we cannot show you all of it, but at least we can, can point to some of the ones we think are quite important. The second one is multi-crisis. When you have a crisis to one company in a sector, it quickly turns into a multi-crisis. We saw that with Telenor. The customer said, don't go to my company. It also has problems. Uh-oh. Huh? Then it moves to the other companies as well. But a multi-crisis for us is a crisis involving two or more organizations and where the focus is on the inter-organizational dimension. And we have two basic types, the horizontal multi-crisis Organizations located at the same level of operations, for instance, within the same sector, if it's public sector, it could be municipalities or within the same industry. And we have vertical multi-crisis where you have organizations located at different levels of operation, for instance, supply chain crisis. But just to give you a short example, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the Volkswagen Dieselgate scandal back in 2015. There were a lot of voices in there because it was a, a global one. Of course, Michael Horn, Environmental Protection Agency, Martin Winterkorn, the CEO, competitors, politicians, activists like Clean Technica, German media, international media, financial experts, et cetera, et cetera. So that's for the, the number of voices. But what is more interesting is Volkswagen had the problem, but every car producer, had to step into that arena to explain what they were doing. Toyota, Renault, Daimler, Honda. Toyota does not engage in any practice that would seek to enhance emissions. Renault complies with all regulations. Honda is confident. So it's just to say that when we have a crisis of one company or one public sector organization, it quickly spread to the others. So they have to prepare, uh-oh, somebody over there has a problem we will get into that arena. We need to prepare for that. We have other interorganizational interdependencies as well. And I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Barnett. Uh, we are very much inspired by it. And he has this idea that the company you keep affects the company you keep. Huh? There are wonderful handbooks out there where they have been studying these interorganizational interdependencies. Uh, because what they say is that if one person or one company or one public sector organization has a problem, uh, it may turn into a reputation commons problem, that the other will also be affected on their reputation uh, for what is going on. And uh, we saw that with the industry, with the Volkswagen example, but also your corporate partners if one of your corporate partners has a problem, it may give a spillover or give you a reputation comes problems. Uh, and that's really, that's really uh, complicated because it means that not only you have to think about your own stakeholders as a company, 
but you also have to think about the stakeholders of your stakeholders. Now it's really getting complicated, is it not? <clears throat> and we have seen a lot of examples on this. Um, we very often name it hijacking, that activist groups, one way to get their message out is to, if they cannot get in contact with, for instance, uh, a company that they disagree with, they may go to the partners of that company because they are interrelated. And we had an example back in 2014 where Greenpeace attacked legal in order to make legal stop being a partner to Shell. Actually, it was a conflict between Greenpeace and, and Shell, but as Shell was not listening to Greenpeace, they decided to go for the partners who had a good reputation at, that could maybe have an impact on. And we have seen a lot of these hijacking things. Um, we have been asking for examples from around the world and we have got a lot of examples. So this is actually a new activist strategy. It's very efficient because you are putting pressure on the partners. So crisis issues may come in from many different corners. Let me see, are you okay with uh, listening? Yeah, you can still manage for another 10, 15 minutes, although it's late Friday night or in the middle of the night for you, Dean Krugerberg. <laughs> I can see that, yeah. Uh, well, what we have been studying during COVID is actually trade associations because they are quite interesting too, because they are kind of intermediary. You know, a trade association is a meta organization. It's an organization composed of other organizations. And that's quite interesting. So there are specific patterns here as well. And during COVID, we saw that trade associations and their member companies, media and public authorities were so mutually interdependent. You know, all the little restaurants that had to shut down and lock down for instance, just to give you one example, had a lot of problems. But if you are a tiny little restaurant with five, 10 people, how can you get to the government doing that? So they went to the trade associations who were representing them in front of the government. So trade associations, one of their patterns is what we have named extra communication. You know, internal communication, they communicate with their staff. Extra communication, they communicate with their members, but it's not out in public. It's not external communication. And then, of course, you have the external communication. But for the extra communication, the communication with their members, they had to guide, interpret, and provide information. And we did interviews with a trade associations in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden during COVID. And they told us that every time a government had had a press conference, they had to go back to all their members to guide, to interpret, what does it mean to me? And what can I do? Do I need lawyers to come in? Or what can I do as a small company? And they had the role of listening. They became psychologists and priesters because people were so desperate about losing their companies. So that was one thing. At the same time, they had to communicate with public authorities and government to make sure that all the problems of the members was actually told to the government. And the government also wanted to learn from them what is actually going on. So they had direct meetings. The media also wanted to learn what's going on with all these uh, companies in crisis. Uh, so actually, these uh, trade association, they managed to have a 400% higher media coverage than during normal times. So they played a huge role because through the media, they were able to impact government, but they were also able to impact potential new, new members who quickly came in to trade associations during, during that crisis. So there are some interesting patterns also when we go to this type of organizations. And I think no matter what kind of organization you may be, you need to know something about these patterns. Um, moreover, uh, we have been working with what about the, the different crisis management fields? If you look into literature, research, very often you find, for instance, people working with corporate crisis communication and corporate crisis management. 
Whereas people working with political crisis communication, they are in another area. Um, and what about the public sector crisis management? But what we see is that actually voices from all these three fields are stepping in when there is a crisis situation. During COVID, it was obvious. You had the public sector, the health authorities, you had the government, local governments, politicians, and you had the companies or the public sector organizations, of course, and citizens and employees and stuff like that. But also during, let's say an accident, during an accident of a company, for instance, an explosion at the harbor, well, politicians come in, huh? because they want to make sure this is not going to happen again. Vote for me next time. Why did the government do nothing about this? Huh? And public sector, yeah, the crisis preparedness people, the emergency officers are also coming in and all of them have a voice. So we think that this is intertwined when you get into a crisis situation. Finally, <laughs> the last example, and this is actually a new project that we are working on right now, uh, together with um, Timothy Coombs and Sherry Holiday. Uh, we hope to present some of it in spring. Uh, because we are very much interested in the polarization going on right now. Uh, the arenas are so polarized, people are not even want to listen to one another. So dialogue, I mean, dialogue is an important concept, but what if people are not listening? And I, I really think that the um, elections in the US show a lot of polarization, but it goes for a lot of topics, not just politics and elections. Uh, so I think we have a problem here. How can we actually explain polarization? Where is it taking place? Are they, these voices, are they in different sub arenas actually? Are they listening? Are they crossing over? So this is a, a new um, study of ours where we want to see if we can get to some patterns, but also to ideas about what to do about it. How can we actually, as communication scholars, contribute with our research on studies like this. So um, that was taking you a trip around <laughs> a lot of different elements, but it was in order to illustrate the communicative complexity because where we think we may contribute um, is um, that we think we, we have taken a third step in communication theory. It's not about transmission and interaction only, it's also about grasping the multivocality and the complexity. Um, RAD is not organization centric. All voices in the arena are per perceived as crisis communicators. It applies to all types of crisis, we think. And as we already said, it's an agonistic model. It recognizes some voices as, as want uh, dialogue and consensus, others absolutely don't. Um, I, I very often give a good example. We have in, in Aarhus, we have a, a company, a Danish, Danish Crown, who are meat producers. And outside their doors, they have a group of vegan activists. Can they go into a dialogue? They want to invite the vegans in, but the only thing the vegans are interested in are closing down the factory, closing down the company. So, I mean, this is, of course, it's a little, a little black and white, but it is illustrating how complicated it is out there for organizations as, as such. And finally, we are also looking at the micro level. We think that it's a good thing with response strategies, but the wordings, the rhetorics, um, rhetorical situations, as you talked about, Mitchell, uh, are important too. So we need to know more about the micro level uh, as well. For practice, do RAD contribute to practitioners sitting out there? We actually think it does, because when they learn about this, they, they get a new understanding of crisis as something that is constructed socially among all these voices who are interpreting what is actually going on, but also that they can never be in control and that they have to try to anticipate the patterns of, in, of interaction and reactions out there to know the rules of the game, so to say. Uh, so in order to navigate, they need to apply a complexity approach, but also to work with crisis management theories and models in daily life, an emergent approach, strategic listening, signal detection, resilience, and stuff like that. 
but also to strengthen their communicative comp competencies. And finally, working more with anticipation. So instead of just going out communicating, you know, spontaneously, try to do diagnosis of what is actually going on. But <laughs> to end, there are limitations to this theory. Uh, we will never, never be able to do a full analysis, we think. And we need to work more with the methods. How can we actually identify these stuff? And finally, Finn and I love to say that RAD is an open theory. We want people to do research, do critique, make it, we want it to expand because we think there are some interesting things here, but we can do much better probably in the years to come. So um, we're very excited about this, as you can hear, uh, but we would be more excited to have your comments and perspectives on what do you think about all this. Further readings, look at the new handbook of crisis communication. It's on its way out um, by Tim Coombs and Sherry Holiday. And we have a chapter in there on the Sabarina thing. Uh, we have also put up here a couple of um, readings uh, if you are interested in, in seeing more of what we're doing uh, right now. So questions? I can see there's a lot in the chat, but I was not able, we were not able to follow that uh, right now. So I don't well, know if you have found that, Michael. I will stop sharing so that we can actually see one another. Hmm? Oh, I think I think Dean is being the farthest away <laughs> in terms of time. It's four in the morning for him. Should get the first chance to say something if he wants to. Yeah. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm interested in this just um, I was trying to relate it at a personal level because there's a very small number of places that um, I boycott, but I I don't even care they know. I, most recently, a uh, place that I used to like, uh, I went there and like, okay, I always order the same thing. And, and I'm always very tolerant of like young people who are clerks and they're learning and everything. And, and um, okay, uh, I went there Sunday and it was more than it normally was because I always order the same thing. It gets me by very well in restaurants. They just walk in, they know what I order. They bring me my food and oftentimes they give me, because they know me, they give me a cut rate on a price. And, you know, so, so this person, uh, well, that's not right. And so the guy in back must be like a new manager and he, he didn't intercede, he just looked like he was acting like the bouncer, you know? And, and so I, um, you know, finally they got it right, and, or okay. And then I went back a couple of days, was well, yesterday, I guess it was, a couple of days, or now two days now, um, you know, and uh, this person now was like even a couple more dollars. I said, well, that's not right, you know. And, and so finally she thought she figured it out, and I looked, no, she didn't. And so I walked out, or I, I walked, you know, the manager, and how are you doing? And I said, you know, she got, that don't you know, just let it go, but she didn't give me this discount, and I walked out, and uh, if, if he was so oh, we're sorry, you know, or something, it would have been fine, but but the thing is, I'm done with that place, uh, and I'm not telling anybody, I'm not tweeting, I'm not writing to them, I'm just done with the place. I got a local Barnes & Noble where the guy annoyed me almost two years ago, and because he acted like he was a bouncer, and told me to put my mask on, there was like nobody within 100 feet, and and I was drinking my coffee. And so I just said so long, I never came back. I don't know if they noticed or not, but my point here, I'm, I'm taking too long to explain it. I don't care. I'm not trying to hurt them. I'm not trying to get a groundswell of uh, you know, public opinion. I just, yeah, I'm done with this place, you know? And so yeah. that's why I'm kind of intrigued by the people where it's kind of a vindictive type of thing. Like, boy, I want to really hurt them. I really want to, you know, I, I'm just done with the place. I don't care if anybody else is or not. And I don't know, I, I, it's almost like an anomaly here because everybody, they want to create, like you talk about kind of a polarization and so forth. And, you know, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I just, no, I don't want to do business. I did with the gas station, some guy, he couldn't figure out my, uh, you know, why the credit card didn't work. And hey, fine, there's, a, you know, plenty of gas stations around here, you know, and I just, I, I, I just don't want the hassle myself. So I'm always kind of intrigued by people want to pick a fight and go public on something. I just say, hey, it's my thing. I'm, I don't care about anybody else. I'm just not going back. 
I, I'm not sure there's no question there, but I, I mean, like I say, I'm just kind of intrigued by the people like, I want to hurt you or I want to do something. I want to create a conflict. And uh, most people are like that. So that's why your research here is important, but I, I just don't get it myself. So. But, 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 but I actually think that you are touching upon some, some interesting because when we look into the arena, that's also why we say it's not just the public sphere. It's also the semi-public sphere, for instance, inside a company, but it's also the private sphere. Yeah. So people are, are reacting. Now you're telling us about your experiences. I mean, yeah. so I mean, I mean, and you are reacting private as well. So actually, if we want to include the whole arena of an issue or a crisis to, for instance, a company, it also includes the private sphere. And that's why- Yeah, no, that's the truth. I mean, you raise that point. I, I mean, none of you are gonna go to this barbecue sandwich place, but, uh, but the thing is here too, I mean, just, I know this Barnes and Noble, okay. you know, I, I told people about it. I just don't put it on social media. I don't wanna, you know, I guess I don't wanna bring myself into the issue. That's a good point, yeah, private. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good, good well, to see I'm, you. I would, let me just add too, I think that uh, I'm saying both um, Finn, when he did the sort of history of crisis, uh, I yeah. think there, there has been this turn, um, when he was just saying this, right? There's been this turn to, polarization and no middle ground and you know scorch and burn and there was a time when you could ask for an apology and if you got it then you were satisfied but yeah. now it's like i'm going to crush them you know i'm going to tweet this to my mm -hmm. million followers or probably not twitter anymore right but anyway there is this real shift i mean that's something i think worth noting in terms of the yeah. history of crisis is that sometime about a decade ago maybe or less we've made this mm -hmm. shift that's changed what we do Mm -hmm. yep. Seriously. Mitchell, you had your yeah. Thank you so much for that. That that was great. I posted my um my question. I actually have two questions, but I I, I won't be uh, so cheeky so early. I'll wait to see if someone else has another one. But my first question relates to, to Elon Musk and Twitter and Twitter as a rhetorical arena. And Michael just made the point there, something happened 10 years ago that shifted things and Twitter happened 10 years ago. <laughs> and so uh, there's a there's a technological uh, dimension that's sort of given rise to deplatforming movements and new politics and a desire for revenge rather than just uh, an, an apology. Musk has come in and totally upset the paradigm, right? He's come in saying that Twitter's the town square, that uh, it's been overly controlled by uh, a PC, uh, police who have been unfairly silencing through shadow banning and manipulating the algorithm, uh, right-wing intellectuals and, and distorting basically the marketplace of ideas on Twitter. And this is the language that he uses, which is really interesting. So it shows that he reads some of our stuff. So who knows, <laughs> Musk might be familiar with rhetorical arena theory himself. Um, so, so, so what's your take yeah. on that, right? So, so he's undoing, he's granting amnesties for all these right-wing intellectuals saying, welcome back, welcome back. And uh, all of my sort of my left-wing colleagues from universities around the world are all sort of trying to quit Twitter and move to Mastodon, um, which of course has its own limitations and problematics for different reasons. So I really like, as, as the big thinkers behind Rhetorical Arena, how does what's happening on Twitter now sit with your theory? And and does your theory offer yeah. a way to, de to determine that? Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I think the, the theory adds to that because the theory claims that it's so dynamic out there. It's never stable. So, uh, and, and that is why when we are starting studying the polarization thing, if you have a sub arena and, and some would say Twitter is a sub arena where you have specific voices going in, they may be taken over by others because there are this constant, constant uh, past and against one another, even in, in, in these sub arenas, as we saw it in the little Telenor case, the faith holders were attacking the others. And mm -hmm. actually, if they are attacking one another inside a sub arena, and then comes in a very dominant person who actually has the power to do stuff, then you are actually maybe able to move people in or out of that sub arena. Sometimes they don't want to be there anymore. And actually we have been discussing with Tim Coombs that uh, tolerance, for instance, talking about the value of tolerance, even if you disagree, if we could make people be more tolerant, but how can we do that? Huh? So, so it's not easy, but I think the dynamic into it means 
that you are never safe. You can never say that Twitter would stay as it has always been. No, because things are constantly happening. So, so that's another thing that we tend to forget in crisis communication. Um, we look at it as if it's one strategy working, but it's over time. And I mean, it, it's we saw it during COVID, smoldering crisis. Things are, uh, are changing. So even if you have got a picture of the arena, it's not the same arena in a couple of months. So that's at least, but, but, but it would be an interesting case to study actually what is going on here right now yeah, but for what, Twitter and Musk. What, what yeah. we need perhaps, or is, is quite sure that we need it, is a concept of power. Mm. Um, it, yeah. there's, there's, no, there's no power talk in our in, arena. In our right arena. Yeah. It's too friendly in, in some <laughs> cases. So that no, that's would, true. Yeah. The power concept could be useful here. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I had, I had a couple you of You had another one? Uh, Sorry? Uh, sorry, I, just, I had a couple of things I was going to throw out um, th that might be of interest um, to how you're thinking about it or not. Um, I know near the end, your third, you had these six points, I think. The third point, which I don't remember what the title was, but um, Noor Oisel looked at that in her dissertation and in some articles where she looked at how um, activists um, were getting around the being activists and buying like shares in the company so they could like bring issues before the company and pressure the company to make a change without ever going public. And it, they were things that never became public issues and no one ever knew about them. And the company would rather fix them and make them happy than bring them public and have a vote. So there is some research on that. If you're, if you want to look into that, I can. Interesting. Yeah. And that then, would be nice. Because in fact, not all crises are going out in public. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, that's true. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, one. Then, um, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say one mitigating factor that um, is maybe more uh, problem in the United States and elsewhere, but um, a very real fear that I think some people that you know, I talk to, including myself, have of something ending up on in an armed conflict you know with all the mass shootings we have and you know where it could be just a innocent bystander or road rage or whatever you know you um my malls uh tend to be well very deferential anyhow but like on the road you know i don't try not to antagonize anybody because the guy's probably you know odds are you know the guy might have a firearm and he might lose it i mean it's just this mass of instability and volatility that is out there that I'm really kind of surprised uh, where some of these people are as antagonistic and um, as um, aggressive as they are because they could be met with very serious uh, well, consequences and in, in reactions for people. But it's just an observation that's probably more accelerated or more pronounced here than elsewhere, but, uh, but it certainly is a uh, factor like you know you think okay this guy didn't stop at the stop sign is this really worth you know guy taking a few shots at me or something like that you know you just I mean talk about tolerant you know a guy gets really tolerant in cases like that where he's a perceived potential danger so yeah lucky you're yeah. not in Texas <laughs> <laughs> anybody else having questions or should we try to look into have you seen in the chat room uh, Michael would there be uh, just a lot of things and people people should just jump in a lot of things that went back and forth I just had two more points I was going to throw out for you to think about yeah. um, uh, there's this very clear in the beginning discussion we were talking about the assumptions of the theory there's this meta communicative aspect to it and um, I you know go back to Watzlawick Bevan and Jackson you know 1967 um, pragmatics of human communication, um, pragmatics of human communication, um, the, the WBJ book, because the, that meta communicative aspect where you're looking at the communication of these other groups, making strategic choices about what you might do. So the rhetorical feature to it. And um, then I just say the last is, um, there, I think there's some clear 
um, first, second, and third persona stuff that you might talk about if you're interested, you know, because mm -hmm. there's the first persona that's already existing of what people have to say to the organization. And then there's the second persona, the implied persona. And I have a, a, a conference paper that I'll be eventually getting out to, to try to get published sometime soon on the fourth persona. And I think a, some of what you're discussing fits into that notion of the fourth persona, which is the this public that should be included in what we do, this taking into account of, of other publics and other stakeholders. So I'm happy to send a copy of that to you if, you're, if you want to see it. But yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Would be interesting. Yeah, super. Yeah, because we do, we do tend to forget that it's not just about the stakeholders. There are really other persons out there, <laughs> for for good the, and for bad. The I would thought say. persona the sounds thought persona. interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Anybody who else wants to jump in? I know because there was a lot of comments in the uh, in the box. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't see it actually. Mm -hmm. Mitchell, you want to have another one? Shima, you got something? Yeah. Shima's got her hand up. Go ahead, Shima. Yes, but Mitchell had a question before me, and his text is also comes before my um, message in please, the chat. Shima, please, <laughs> you go first. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering how corporation, how can corporations in crisis respond to multiple voices, um, to be consistent in in the responses, because the answer seems contradictory to the context based theory, which posits that based on the argument that the corporation should have a specific kind of response. But in in um, the rhetor in, in rhetorical arena theory, we have multiple voices. Then the voices might be contradictory. Uh, how uh, the corporation can respond um, that in a way that works well um, um, for, for all those multiple voices. Yeah. It has always been a problem also for the stakeholder theory. What do you do when your stakeholders have conflicting expectations to you as a company? Uh, so, so we are familiar with that dilemma also from, from these. But, but during a crisis situation, it's true, you need to be consistent, but we very often see that there's a learning curve, that companies are actually moving and adapting when they learn more about what people actually want from them. And, and unfortunately, very often they are so long at getting to the apology or to listening to people. But um, what we have seen with communication, and we have seen some examples, is the topic of strategic ambiguity. Remember the topic of Eric Eisenberg? Um, and, uh, you know, we are very often talking about honesty, clear, transparent communication and stuff like that. But in some situation, uh, as we know that people are interpreting stuff from different perspectives, the concept of strategic ambiguity could actually be useful. I'm not saying that it, you should mislead people. That's not what it's behind strategic ambiguity, but that you actually try to address um, more things at one and the same time. And, and I actually think in the case of um, Lico and Shell and Greenpeace, uh, Lico knew that to get out of the criticism from Greenpeace, wanting legal to stop collaborating with Shell, they have to give in to some point. And they actually, I think, ended up in a kind of strategic ambiguity, telling Greenpeace, okay, we will stop to work, we will stop the contract with Shell once the contract ends. What does that mean? Did they want to stop the contract? Yes, but not now, when it ends. But they knew this could be interpreted as a victory for Greenpeace that they gave in on Shell. But they still lived up to their expectations from Shell to live up to a contract of partnership. So I think they were trying to be a little ambiguous here. And mm -hmm. Greenpeace was satisfied. Shell was OK. They, uh, and the other partners of Lego said, OK, Lego lives up to its partnerships. So I mean. This is just one example, but that's where strategic ambiguity comes in. You need really to be clever here and to anticipate the reaction, but you can never satisfy all the conflicting voices out there. And that's the dilemma. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Next, do you have yeah. as well? Yeah, I do. S sorry, um, but this is a rare opportunity to, 
connect with you, so I want to seize it. Um, I, I'm curious to what extent uh, RAT um, overlaps with other competing concepts. So you've spoken already about the public sphere. We have a sense about how it's different there. But we have the older concept of the strategic situation uh, that comes out of American rhetoric theory from the mid 20th century. I think it's Burke, isn't it? But we even uses uh, the rhetorical situation a lot in his work and so does, so does Bob Heath. Um, so am I right in thinking that the rhetorical arena theory, it, it places, it overlaps, but it places more of an emphasis on platforms and social media affordances, you know, the, the technological infrastructure that supports the transmission of ideas. So I suppose um, that's one question. And the other, the other related part to that is there's also that competing concept of issue arenas out there that comes from Voss. Um, you know, so you're familiar with it. So to what extent is, is that overlapping or is it entirely distinct? So that, they're my two questions. Thank you. Just a little bit of the yeah. Yeah. Um, Just a few words about Marita's concept of issue arena. Um, frankly speaking, we, we don't we don't like it. Uh, uh, we we disagree that it is because um, uh, she 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 never really defined what she what she understands by by arena. Or maybe I could add to that one. They are looking at the public sphere only, mm -hmm. uh, where, where we want to also include the semi-public and the uh, private sphere, for one thing. So they are looking into the discussions going on uh, in the public sphere. So that's one difference, we think. You have others? It, 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 yeah, we have um, Juliane Raub, who, uh, she's a German scholar, I'm sure that you know. Uh, uh, she has written quite a lot about the, the the rhetorical arena, and she's trying to to use the concept of network, for example, um, media sphere, to have something which is similar to 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 the rhetorical arena, but still it's 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 quite different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, there's a lot of um, clarification. We, we needed to do a lot of clarification to to in order to distill a more clear understanding of uh, the concept of uh, rhetorical arena. Uh, but but for the rhetorical situation, um, we, we are not just working with, with um, technology and, and platforms because exactly we want to say it's not about platforms. And that's why we are a little critical to the first ideas about sub arenas because a sub arena is not just equal a social media platform because then it's just a communication channel. And what is then the difference between a communication channel and as an arena? So we have been discussing a little bit about discourse communities, that it's also a matter of discourse communities. So actually we are bringing in other concepts as well, but we are interested in, in the micro, um, the rhetorics as well. So it's not just a matter of- Just to inform you about the concept of discourse, uh community it's it's more like a theory uh, belonging to the field of uh, genre analysis it's it's genre analysis yes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you that means i have to make revisions to an article that i just submitted <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh it's nice to have some work isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah anybody else but it's really nice to have your views on this. It's, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to, to discuss it. Uh, yeah, and it's, there's so many, like I got a whole you know, sheet of stuff you know, that I could talk about. We, we'll do a call one of these days, just us if you want, we can go through some of the stuff. Cause I think there's just so many things. Yeah. There. And, and I'm also, you know, so is shit storm a technical term? It is, it is. in Europe at least. <laughs> it's a firestorm we know you call it firestorm that's uh, it's a german word by the way and it spread through europe but i still remember when we used it the first time for an international conference in the u.s we were told it's you have to use firestorm 
yeah. <laughs> but Michael, perhaps we, we will have to change a few things because we we get a more and more bad reputation talking about rats and yeah, rats. Yeah, <laughs> I, well, I think you got to work on that acronym. Yeah. yeah, Finn wanted that acronym actually. No, I think it was it was Tim who suggested it, and I said yes. Yeah. this is this is it. Yeah, yeah. No, it was fun when we started doing that. Yeah, yeah, and we need some fun too, don't we, as communication scholars? So, well, you know, I, one question I had, which is that there's this um, implied not to diminish this because this is so much more sophisticated, but I mean, implied in all of those other theorists and Tim and in Keith and in Bill and everyone else, right, is that um, they're aware of all this because they've done research and everything else, but, you know, take Benoit or or Tim, right, but the premise of most of these theories is just responding to the crisis, is just putting out messages and they have so little capacity to deal with the complexity of the issue like you're doing here. So I think it's interesting that they've just ignored all these things, you know, in most of our theory. Yeah. yeah. But 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 that was also what started us because we could see uh, it's nice to know what to say and to study the response strategies. And it's nice to know what's going on in the mind of people because Tim was studying attribution theory. What, what are they actually thinking when a company is communicating? Really good stuff. Uh, but we saw that there were so many other voices interfering out there. Uh, and that was why we are still very appreciative around their crisis response strategies. But we need to do much more. And of course, we do have a few other crisis communication strategies like stealing thunder, uh, inoculation, um, the renewal discourse theory of Alma, Seeger, and Selnau. We do have others, but 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 most of it was about response, as if we are only reacting once we are out there. Why not be more proactive as well? Um, so so I think you're right, um, Michael, that complexity adds to it, and I think we we are good at dealing with complexity because we know how to look into communication. Yeah. yeah and I guess I all those other publics you've talked about the you know the internal publics and the micro publics you know have always been part of that but we just sort of pretend that they're not sorry about that dean oh that's okay i um missed a couple minutes here uh, as i explained in the chat so i think a lot of this kind of goes down to a very base level here um i always look and some of my colleagues uh, marina winovich and other uh, you know three social actors uh, governments and then ngo cso's and then corporations and of course you got private citizens there's other factors there but the role of corporations uh which uh i think uh, can vary tremendously and I'm, I'm a little troubled by some of the uh uh, apparently ostensibly well-meaning uh, like corporate social advocacy. I don't want them being too much of an advocate because if they're a corporate citizen, they're way too powerful. They're far more powerful than I am as a private individual citizen. I uh, one time, uh, I guess it was AJMC a couple of years ago in Toronto, I um, had an agency, um, uh, the agency, uh, I guess it was Edelman Luncheon, but I don't know if they were the ones that, but they had this, I think it was Domino's Pizza, I'm pretty sure that's correct. And they had this commercial on that says, hey, we drive these roads. And so what we're doing is filling potholes on the roads to help the roads, you know, maintenance of the roads. Well, I, as a citizen, I don't want some guy wearing a goofy hat at night in my headlights filling a pothole because one, he doesn't know what he's doing. Two, it's not his job. It's the government for which I pay taxes. And this confounding of, uh, or um, I guess, the variance in what is the role of the corporation. I know this can vary from, from country to country, of course, and nation state to nation state. But I am very nervous when corporations declare, at one level, I, I understand, okay, corporate citizenship. But if they are a citizen like I am a citizen, they're a lot more powerful than I am with far bigger budget in, in being uh, in exerting their influence as a citizen. So I think um, it's kind of a long winded way of saying that I think the idea, what is the role, the appropriate, the optimal role of the corporation as a collective citizen, if you will, um, uh, and uh, how does that relate to uh, others? And that to a great extent, 
would um, dictate like how should they react to a complaint, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I'm not developing that sufficiently, but I think you see where I'm going with that. Yeah. But 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 I think it's interesting, and that that's why I I, I we put up this about citizenship, brand activism, but also mm -hmm. companies as, pol as politicians, because it's really appreciated right now in Ukraine that companies actually stand up for them, and of course you can still discuss are they too powerful um, and so forth, but people also expect them to step up. So so it's it's a dilemma to companies as well, mm -hmm. and companies are are populated with people and citizens mm -hmm. have changed i think that's why that so many companies work with sustainability issues and stuff like that so it is a little but i understand your fear in one way because mm -hmm. they are powerful on the other hand because they are powerful they can actually also be there for for something good it's not necessarily just but but it's tricky is it not <laughs> it is yeah because like yeah. with ukraine i think everybody would agree like oh, okay that's good. They withdrew from Ukraine, but if they use it as a political platform, it, I, it's something I happen to agree with. But still, it makes me nervous because what if they were saying, "Hey, we, you know, we will stay in in Russia or whatever"? Uh, uh, it's the power that makes me uh, nervous. There, I mean, they have the right to do what they want, but this idea but, of uh, Dean, advocacy but, makes me very nervous. Yeah. But Dean, they, it's also risky business to them, is it not? I mean, you That's have seen right. a, lot of companies, a lot of companies going in, also Danish companies, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, participating in the discussion in the U.S. about abortion laws. Yeah. It's risky. I mean, if it they is, go in supporting something, they have the Republicans on their neck, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, they are really taking more risks today than they were uh, beforehand yeah. by doing no, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's a brand new world that we have to take yeah. into it. That's why we're talking about this is the new normal, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anything it really else? makes me wonder. Yeah, it does make me ponder. I think about this a lot as the, um, uh, the existing theory, well, that's kind of like the thesis of what you're getting at too, but what we've had in the past in public relations, whether it's the role and function, it's, uh, you know, it's based theories, it's assumptions about theory of a society if it's adequate for today's world. And I think all, all this is fears, reflection and consideration, you know, just the base theories of society. I, I'm not advocating one, I'm just saying that I think we really need to sit back and question, as you've done here, as you reviewed this, um, you know, where are we at right now? Because I don't think it's necessarily that we're going to build, you know, it's an additive type of thing. I need to really, you know, reflect, okay, here's today's world. What does, do our assumptions, our, uh, you know, our um, foundational theories, are they sufficient or is this a time for a new Thomas Kuhn type new paradigms or what I was writing in a forward a book with um, Kate Weaver and uh, Donald and Pomper and uh, Katie Place, or that's not the order of the authors, but you know, are we at the end of a life cycle? We need to consider a new life cycle, um, uh, mutated one in public relations theory. And I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying, I think that's a question that has to be considered. So there's a lot to do for all of us out there, huh? Must be nice for young students to know that <laughs> you're needed. <laughs> yeah, I remember when you first started talking about some of these ideas, you know, like a decade ago, and, you know, to see that they're growing into this, you know, more coherent thing is, is always, you know, we don't think about these things when we study something the first time or the second time, we're just yeah. going to get published, we're writing an article, but, you know, eventually when you think about them a lot and you start testing them and refining them and trying new things, it starts, you know, you, that's how theory's built. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
So I'm just excited by that. I'm just going to finish if I could by saying I'm really excited by the unifying potential of RAT. You know, I sort of see it as uh, one of those big macro concepts that only comes along every, every couple of, you know, maybe every decade, maybe every two decades. Uh, but its ability to sort of situate other theories at a micro, at a micro and a meso level within that, such as dialogue, such as Coombs's uh, work, and even engagement uh, from, from Kim. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to see where you take it. And I encourage you to explore the power dimensions more by perhaps looking at political economy or even Foucault's stuff on discourse power. I think that would fit nicely with what you were talking about with discursive um, mm -hmm. you know, dimensions of community and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, look, thanks so much. I, I really enjoy this. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, in English, it's a rather, uh, well, it's a rather unfortunate acronym, uh, RAT, uh, for it to be described as such, but I guess we can live with that. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Should yeah. we, Thank should you we all wrap it you. up? Should we wrap yeah. this up tonight? Dean's not going to get back to bed because <laughs> it's like six, five in the morning for him, but yeah. my, my dog wants he, to go he, out. He, so he, I, he's such a survivor type. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> when will we see you again? Yeah. I don't know. That was so great in uh, Ukraine in uh, October. That was so great. See what a wonderful time. So anyhow, so well, we'll see everybody, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for coming. It was it was excellent. It was very nice. Sure was. Okay. And do contact us, okay? If if you want more discussion, it goes for all of you. Nice mm -hmm. to see you.